All right, Dre. So we are recording on 825. Yesterday was, of course, 824. I think it's only right that we start this episode with a break to mama mentality on three. Ready? Three, two, one. Quiet on the set, make sure my mic is on There is Dre and Juju Dog diving towards the pylon Go for two, so damn rude, recognize authority Spitting tips for fantasy, no way you're outscoring me Bold predictions with conviction every single day Sports addiction, no restriction, kicking game like Pele He's the greatest, what's the basis? Pick an athlete, let's debate this game Outrageous trading places, sudden death, take them pace Turn and shoot, boys the truth, mamba mentality Future greats take their place, dreams become reality Blowing outside, knocked it out the park Your boy discovered fire like a rock with a spark Reps acting like Neanderthals, phantom flags, nothing calls Heartbreak losses, tragic falls, every week discuss it all Settle in, listen up Free of time like Andrew Luck Show's about to stop I suggest you buckle up Mamba mentality Shout out to you Kobe Yesterday was your day And Dre's Lakers did not disappoint I'm your host Juju Talk Sports This is MMA Dre here This is Slump Buster Episode 67 guys Welcome into today's episode I want to start off today's show by Quickly addressing real quick, because as you can tell, Dre, I am rocking the nice swing bit shirt here that just you came in the mail play. yesterday. Got to, give a huge, got to give a huge plug here to Corked Bats, one of the Instagram accounts that we follow. They have a plenty of these shirts, but I have to address it right off the bat because I know one of our friends of the show, longtime viewer, Annie O'Donnell, might be watching this, and I just want to put it out there. I am not a closeted Dodgers fan. Kill that narrative right now. Let it die. San Francisco Giants fan till I die. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm not one to pass up on a great internet meme. And this is exactly why I'm rocking this nice swing bit shirt. It's more of a statement on the Astros, right? Uh, yeah, I think so, right? It's, uh, it's sort of a jab at them more than it is a support of the Dodgers. So exactly. I, I, mean, it. I mean, come on. Like that whole... I don't know how to do the facial expression. How do you do it? What's your best Joe Kelly impression? This is a video episode, by the way, if you're confused <laughs> as fuck listening to this on audio only. Um, <laughs> I know. I don't even know. I don't even know how he would do it. That one where he's turned it's away. Kinda like, away. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like you have to get that lower lip up there to kind of yeah, like yeah. really put that Joe Kelly face spin on it. But <laughs> <laughs> moving off of that to the other team based in LA, of course, like I mentioned, the Lakers had a big W on Kobe Bryant Day. Dre, I guess game time, it's over. He's also out for game five. So if you're probably listening to this, the Lakers already advanced to face the winner of the um, Oklahoma City-Houston Rockets matchup. So mm-hmm. what would you think of last night's performance by your boys? No, nah, it's been fantastic. And you know, it was funny as we were clowning on them the whole time ever since they lost that first game to Portland. Yeah. And everybody was like, we're super worried, right? And where it was as the Clippers, they didn't look too good. And everybody was like, oh, the Clippers are going to be fine. It's the best roster in basketball. And it's like, well, now who looks good and who's looking a little bit, you know, a little bit soft right now. And, you know, the Clippers aren't looking, aren't looking the greatest, but the Lakers, on the other hand, man, they've had a fantastic rejuvenation. I really do think that losing that first game just, you know, stuck, like lit a fire up their asses or something like that, right? Like, the, mm-hmm. the team looked good. Defense was fantastic. They were shutting Portland down. And Portland is definitely known as more of an offensive team than they are a defensive team. So I just thought, you know, the defense-wise, especially in the last two games, has just looked fantastic. But then the offense started to come alive this game. And if the Lakers play like that, I think they are easily the best team in the league. Like, there's no stopping them, and they're getting stops on defense. So I was extremely pleased. Um, and a lot of the players that we picked up, have been really good this this series. So um, we've picked up, you know, like J.R. Smith, for instance. He's played vital roles. And then um, one of the uh, Morris twins, right, has also done really good, or Morris Brothers, has also done really good for us. So I, I really do think that, you know, we're just doing a, a, a really good, really good job all around. All our players are starting to contribute. Uh, I knew that we would miss Avery Bradley, but defensively it looks like everybody's starting to pick it up. And then Danny Green, right, like if that dude – continues to stay hot and can keep going 
Like it's going to be a scary night if all our shots are falling and we're really solid on defense. So I'm excited. <laughs> so obviously over the last couple of days, I've seen a lot of Lakers Twitter and it's funny. I've seen so many accounts. I apologize to you, Danny Green. Please, Danny Green, just unblock me. It's hilarious how quick fan hoods can like turn. I've also seen Skip Bayless's Twitter account. And I swear, Skip is just an internet troll that happens to have a TV show. Because even after blowing out the Trail Blazers by 20 points, he's still over there. Man, you know what? They would have been in round two had they not blown game one. It's like, dude, they just rocked them for the past two games. Skip, skip me with that bullshit. Am I right? Um, but no, it was just a dominant performance. You know you're in trouble when KCP and Danny Green are hitting those shots. That was the big problem in those last few games or the restart to the bubble. Those shots weren't landing. And it became more apparent the holes in the Lakers roster. And overall, we know it's not a great outside shooting team. That's one of the biggest problems. And that's when LeBron is at his best, when he's able to drive and kick to those like open perimeter shooters. The problem is, again, if you're driving and kicking to a perimeter shooter that's a low percentage shot, that's not going to be the best results for this Lakers roster. So I think they've showed up big, unlike their LA counterpart, as you mentioned, the Clippers. So Saturday's matchup against the um, Dallas Mavericks was insane. Or was it Sunday? Either way, it was just one of the best performances I have ever seen on live sport, live sports or anything. I turned on the game in the fourth quarter because I was like, oh man, this is actually close because I, at, the, at the time I thought Luca was going to be rolled out for the game because he had left the previous game twice due to an ankle injury. It was actually, yeah. it was actually Christoph Porzingis that was out this game. And sure enough, 43 points dropped by Luca and the game winning three in overtime. This man, you want to talk about Mamba mentality on Kobe's 42nd birthday? Luca's it. Luca is going to be trouble. That is one bitch ass white boy that you have to watch out for. I tell you what. <laughs> let's now let's be clear. That is a quote. You're not. That being is racist, a quote. Too. I am not. <laughs> that was. We do have straight out of the mouth of Montrez Harrell. I do have to clarify that you are correct. If someone was to take that out of line, but I got to tell you. I'm, I'm with Luca. He is the future of this league. I, I mm -hmm. said it before on the show. I said it in fact in our last episode, the Dallas Mavericks will be in NBA finals within the next five years. Take that to the bank. Yeah, no, I absolutely 100% agree. And everybody had thought right away that, like I said, oh, the Clippers, they're the best roster in basketball, which I really think if you look at it on paper, they are extremely deep and extremely good. And if everybody can play to their full ability, they look fantastic. But, you know, Paul George hasn't lived up to his name. And, you know, a lot of their other players, like, throughout the series, even Kawhi Leonard throughout the series sometimes doesn't always look that great. You, you, you misquoted. I mean, clearly, Pandemic P has lived up to his nickname. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me pull yeah. up some stats, actually, on Pandemic P, because I actually found the great post that just sums everything up in his performance so far in this playoffs. Mm -hmm. I'm, of course, going to put this post. Uh, if you're Again, if you're watching on you, the YouTube You'll see this post on the channel, but here was his stat line from that game. And it's just, oh my God, like when you're like Kawhi and you were thinking, okay, I'm going to go to the Clippers. I'm going to be with another all-star who's dynamic can shoot from outside, great defender, talented athletic wing. You are not expecting these stats, 45 minutes, nine points, three assists, Three for 14 from the field and one from seven from three. Like, it's are, awful. You, are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I think Kawhi at this point is going to self-report Paul George to the uh, COVID authorities. He's going to tell Chris <laughs> Paul that he's been sneaking out with Lou Williams to get some more wings because that is inexcusable from an all-star who has a Gatorade sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Bush Parker with a Gatorade spark sponsorship. Are you kidding me? No, it, it, it's insane. And like, that's the thing is, you know, Paul George was touted as this big recruit and a lot of Lakers fans were upset that he sort of spurned the Lakers. Right. And was, you know, obviously decided to stay in Oklahoma city. Then the very next season comes out to LA, but for the other team, but it's looking like, Hey, maybe we shouldn't have got him. Like maybe we shouldn't have been that worried because like, yes, he's great in the regular season and he technically is an all-star, but when it comes to the playoffs, we see it time and time again that he just shrinks it. I don't know if it's a pressure issue or if it's maybe the season's been too long, but you would think that they had plenty of rest, right? So 
Hopefully it wouldn't be the length of the season that got to him this time. So I don't know what it is, but he looks awful. But, you know, going back to, to Luca and, you know, Dallas, like you said, I, I can easily see them being in the finals within the next five years. If you told me within the next two or three years, even, I would say, okay, I can see that. Like they've got such a good team. Luca's doing such a fantastic job. They're extremely well coached. Um, Luca only went third overall as well. So think about like everybody that drafted above him. And, you know, it's sort of like the, the Pat Mahomes feeling of like, wow, like who, who would you take above that guy, right? Um, so I guess hindsight is always twenty twenty. But no, the, the Dallas Mavericks, they're definitely a tough team. And I'm glad that the Clippers were on that side. And this is why it's so important to have, you know, that one seed and get as good of a seed as you can. And that's why I was happy the Lakers didn't take the whole, you know, load management approach and decided we're just going to go balls to the wall, get the one seed and get the easiest path to the finals. No, let's not. You, you know, I can give DeAndre Aiden a pass when it comes to the Suns. Let's talk about those Atlanta Hawks trading Trey Young for Luka. That swap, that is going to be one of those that you look back on. I know Trey Young's an all-star. I'm still not sold on the guy personally. I feel as though if you're in the Eastern Conference and you're as talented as I'm told Trey Parker is, or Trey Young is, then you should be able to um, do better than what a 19 win record. The Hawks were horrible. I guess that's my bottom line point. Yeah, and I, I think part of that could have been you know monetary, right? And that Trey Young already had a following from college, so it's like, hey, if we pick up one of the hottest young you know stars from college basketball he's bound to bring fans with him too, right? Whereas Luca, nobody in the United States really knew or cared about Luca. Everybody had heard he was going to be good. Everybody had heard like, hey, in Europe, there's this kid that's balling out. Like he's going to be a sick pro. But was anybody like really watching Luca's games? Eh, not really. I, we, we talked about this actually last episode as well, how technically you can watch and have more access to these international games via YouTube. If you want to type in any international players, stats or games, you could just check them out, the highlights on YouTube. That's where the NCAA still does have a role in today's society, the most exposure for these players. But similarly to Sacramento, drafting Marvin Bagley over him, uh, that's rough if you're the Sacramento Kings and you haven't had a real com competent team in over, I don't know, 15 years more or less. And it's even more in, inexcusable considering they have Lottie uh, as their GM at the time, and he passed on an international player like Luka Doncic. But the guy's a stud. I, I loved watching him. That was a hell of a performance. And there was almost little doubt in my mind that he was going to hit that three at the end. That step back, it, oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I'm like, if this goes to Luka, it's going in. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I need more. I need to see what happens. But watch, we're recording this episode as the Dallas Mavericks and Clippers kick off game three, or sorry, game five. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, watch, they're going to get blown out by 30 since I'm hyping them up so damn much. <laughs> I know, that's going to be the thing. But if the Clippers do lose this series, right, I, then that's a big but and that's a big if, right? Because we, we know, again, I truly believe the Clippers probably do have the most talent-rich roster in all of the NBA. Like, they're, they're really good. But if they lose, what does that say about the whole load management thing, the pairing of the all-stars, right? You've got Doc Rivers, like, and a lot of people have already said, like, Doc's not that great of a coach, right? He had some really good teams in Boston, and they were sort of just overrated because they were always, you know, running through the East. So I don't know what that says about the Clippers is that, like, hey, maybe load management wasn't worth it, and you guys didn't even play together as a team for, you know, at least half the season. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the Eastern Conference because – my Celtics broke out the brooms to sweep the 76ers off the court. So Joel Embiid, no Ben Simmons, and Brett Brown, bye. See you later. He officially got the can this week. What do you think about the 76ers roster moving forward? Do you think that they just have to blow it up now? I think you got you to gotta move somebody. And they're just too expensive, right? Um, we know that they picked up like Horford. We know that they've got Simmons. We know that they've got Embiid. And those are going to be guys that demand a whole lot of money, right? And on a different team, they're each probably close to, if not a fully max player. And it's obviously not working, right? And I, I granted, right, Simmons has been hurt this entire series. 
And so you could argue that, well, they didn't have, you know, one of their best players in, but we've seen time and time again that the formula just isn't working for them. So I really do think that they need to make a choice of who do you want to build around, right? Is it going to be Embiid? Then you got to, you know, pick up some pieces that are going to help fit that system. Guys that'll spread the floor a lot better than some of the other guys that you're pairing them up with. Uh, maybe you have a lot more, you know, quick shooters that are good wing defenders, stuff like that, um, rather than trying to sort of duplicate skill sets in which it's just drive to the paint all the time. Now, we just had the draft lottery, so I want you to approach this question both ways. I want you to approach it both as the Golden State Warriors and as the 76ers. Golden State has the two pick. Joel Embiid, we need to move off somebody. Do you make that trade number two straight up for Joel Embiid on both sides of the aisle? Ah, for Joel Embiid, man. And you know that Golden State. They're a center away, you would say. They really are. They really are. They've already got all the pieces. I mean, and Kavon Looney, right, is just not doing. Like, he's good. uh, Don't get me wrong, but just not doing justice at the center. He's not Joel Embiid, I guess is the point. Absolutely not. And so if I'm Golden State, I do. I I would say I do it right away, right? Is because that's the type of system I think Joel Embiid is going to be really successful in and that it spaces the floor so well around him, right? You're always at threat of, you know, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson. I don't know what they're going to do with um, Andrew Wiggins, right? They would not salary wise. I'd have to look to see what their salary cap situation is sort of looking like. They may have to move off Wiggins too in that instance, but I would definitely take Embiid over Wiggins any day in that system. And, you know, you can find the other wings that you need. So if I'm Golden State, I 100% do it. If I'm the 76ers though, I don't know. This draft isn't super deep. I think it's another draft where it's like the top, you know, one through five are pretty much guaranteed. Uh, Yes, there's going to be like Mellow Ball and, you know, some of these other really highly touted prospects, but is it enough to, you know, replace Embiid? I don't know. So, so yes, on the Golden State side, 76ers, I give it a little bit more pause. If you did that, if you're the 76ers, you can move Horford to more of a small ball center, I would say. And then you're looking at hopefully Anthony Edwards doesn't go one and potentially you can say, well, we've, we've talked about, him needing a big market, LaMelo Ball at two, LaMelo and Ben Simmons, would that be a good fit? Stylistically, I have my questions because I don't know how good of a shooter Ball is at this point. He does kind of similarly have a broken shot in the same way his brother does. The only difference is it lands at a higher rate than Lonzo's does at this time. We'll see. If you're the 76ers, May nah, I, I don't know. I wouldn't do it if I'm the 76ers. If I'm the Golden State Warriors and I just want to piss off the rest of the NBA, I'd probably do it. Joel, 100%. Clay, Steph, good luck. <laughs> we're back in the same position we were a couple years ago. But no, we know the Golden State Warriors. They're eyeballing Giannis. Giannis and Steph, that's how they're going to piss off the rest of the NBA. I know. And Giannis just won uh, Defensive Player of the Year, which I – dot anthony davis got screwed out of that right maybe i'm a little bit biased as a lakers fan Uh, i did not think that Giannis from a defensive like he's a good player for sure but i think it was more of like a popularity thing honestly than so are you gonna be more pissed whenever he wins the mvp over lebron absolutely i mean look at what lebron's doing in this year in his season right like his year 50 season or however old he freaking is um no i'll be pissed but uh, I mean, without a doubt, Giannis is a good player. And if he does end up on Golden State, the entire league, I think, will be pissed off. Isn't it ironic that the only team in the Eastern Conference that didn't have a first-round sweep was the Milwaukee Bucks? I know they're probably going to put the Magic away tomorrow in Game 5. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you have the Miami Heat, sweep. You have the Celtics, sweep. You have the Toronto Raptors, easy easy sweep over the Nets. Yep. So, the Eastern Conference is pretty much set. We still need to figure out some stuff in the Western Conference. The Denver Nuggets and the Utah Jazz went back and forth. Oklahoma City managed to still win over the Houston Rockets. So, again, James Harden's postseason lack thereof a success. Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to be an interesting series. Is Chris Paul's lack thereof a postseason success going to outshine that with James Harden? Interesting storyline there. And then, again, we talked about what's going on with the Clippers in the Mavericks. But moving away from the NBA. And just live update, Clippers are killing the Mavericks, just like we said, (laughs) right? (laughs) Of of course, uh, because I I had to hype up Luka so damn much 
that that would happen. But at the same time, we've also seen them blow leads. So I'm not going to count them out just based off a great first quarter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, moving on into the next set of headlines today. So we're moving from away from the NBA back to the NFL. Before we get into our NFC South breakdown, we have to address Earl Thomas, no longer a Raven. He's had, definitely had an interesting offseason, to say the least. It all started at the start of quarantine, where perhaps one of the weirdest sports headlines in recent history came about. So his um, girlfriend, wife, I forget, significant other, basically, was curious, hey, where's Earl at? We're supposed to be in lockdown. We're not supposed to be out and about. Let me go ahead and log into his Snapchat. Turns out Earl just happens to be in ghost mode. So naturally, she says, let me open up Snap Maps and see exactly where he's at. And she, she found out where. He, but it was innocent. He was with his brother, right? Nothing crazy could be going on. Or so we thought. Took a turn. I don't know if I want to explain the whole story. Everyone should know what happened more or less in that exchange. But basically, I, if anyone that has a brother, this would not be at the top of my priority list of things to do is brotherly bonding. I'm going to put that out there. Um, as far as moving forward, so in training camp, Ravens training camp the other day, he was involved in a fight with another defensive back on the team. Apparently, it was such a... Apparently, it was such a big argument, big disagreement, that the Ravens front office said, we're done. We're cleaning our hands of this. Bye, Earl Thomas. See you later. And since it was conduct detrimental to the team, the Ravens don't necessarily have to pay him the guaranteed money, from my understanding. So another team is going to be able to pick him up relatively cheap here. Earl Thomas, landing spots. Where do you see him going, Dre? Uh, let's see. I know that the 49ers have been linked to him a lot, so that'll be your boys. But I just recently read a report that the 49ers probably won't, you know, take him. Uh, and I think some of it is just behavioral issues, and it would help solidify that defense that was already bringing sort of possibly a cancer into your locker room, right? And we've seen time and time again our favorite person on the show, Antonio Brown, right? Like, there's some times where it doesn't matter how good the guy is, it doesn't matter if he's an all pro. Like, you just, it's not worth it. So like it could be really good. Um, I would be, I would be interested in some of the teams that maybe lacked some of that uh, like really good defensive backs, uh, maybe like a Philadelphia or, or something like that. Though I think they loaded up pretty good already on the defensive side uh, in this year's off season. Uh, and then the Cowboys are always looking for uh, people that are getting in trouble. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Cowboys are trying to make a swing to make it work with the salary cap. Well, the thing about Earl Thomas and the Dallas Cowboys, they've been connected very recently just because of Earl's own actions. While he was a member of the Seahawks, Earl Thomas very famously went up to Jason Garrett, who was the coach at the time, and said, come get me. He even did went as far as to follow Jason Garrett into the Cowboys locker room to complete that act. Surprisingly, he didn't sign with the Cowboys when he was a free agent. He ended up in Baltimore to be the leading fullback for Derrick Henry in the playoffs. But it's a match made in heaven. The only thing that I think could slow that potentially up is, of course, how much is Earl going to cost? Because obviously the Cowboys need to figure out stuff with Dak. Now, from the other standpoint here, are the Ravens a better or worse defense? going into this year obviously we did already did our AFC North breakdown what do you think Dre yeah I mean anytime that you lose a talent that's that good like I think you're going to be worse on defense no matter what like that's hard to replace but sometimes you know there is that what they say right addition by subtraction and that from the reports it sounded like you know not only was Earl Thomas's behavior questionable outside of the football field uh, but just his conduct when it came to actually like practice he wouldn't either practice hard or he wouldn't show up sometimes or doing game day preparations. He, you know, seemed to basically disregard what the rules and had when it came to game day. And so when you have somebody that's acting like that, like, yes, they are a contributor on the field, but maybe it is better to move off of them and you can have the whole defense working, you know, sort of as a cohesive unit, everybody's bought in 
and you have no just individual actors. So do I think they're going to be better on defense? Of course not. Not from like, you know, if you're just looking at the personnel that they have, um, but it's possible that the team just plays a little bit better, uh, just depending on how bad Earl Thomas's behavior is. It doesn't seem like, you know, it was, it was that, you know, irreparable, but uh, we'll see. But again, I don't think that they'll necessarily be better on defense. Well, the guy definitely has a lot of fight in him. Um, so he's now going to be fighting for a roster spot and to continue his job in the NFL. Like you mentioned, we've seen guys like this who have an interesting track record find themselves in situations where they don't get signed right away. NFL teams will stay away. So it's a matter of does your bullshit outweigh your talent? Earl Thomas still talented. He's not as talented as he once was, but he can help a team that's trying to win now. All right. Well, let's ta talk you about the most talented in men's grooming. Let's tell you about manscaped.com. Now, if you don't have your lawnmower 3.0, don't worry. We got you covered. You just need to go use promo code slump, save 20% off, plus free shipping and handling, and the best ball trimmer on the open market. They have tons of great products, not just the lawnmower 3.0, but they, of course, have the chafeless boxer briefs. They have the Crop Preserver, which is an outstanding ball deodorant, definitely a big for the ladies right there. And all of these products combined make up the perfect package 2.0. So go ahead, again, save some money, use our promo code on that. And then when you save that money, please use it to reinvest with our other sponsor. Check out Razorsport.com, R-A-Z-E-R Sport.com. So we have tons of playoff basketball going on. We have Major League Baseball. We're about to start NFL season here in about three weeks. So you need to start placing some bets. So you need to know who's going to win those matchups, who's going to put more green in your pocket, and these guys know exactly who to bet on. So go ahead and check out both our sponsors. Here is a quick message from them. This is message brought to you by the Foundation for a Perfect Package. Why do I need Manscaped? Why do I need Manscaped? Why do I need Manscaped? Because the only fruit I want is the one of ten. Because being in a relationship is not an excuse to be lazy. Because I like talking ball, not smelling like them. Because deforestation is proven to prevent forest fires. Manscaped is the only brand dedicated to below the waist grooming. Manscaped's Crop Preserver guarantees that you smell your best all day long. Manscaped Boxer Briefs are the most comfortable underwear on the market. Manscaped's advanced skincare technology makes Nick's a thing of the past. Manscaped is the number one in men's grooming. Subscribers get two free blade refills every three months. Get 20% off plus free shipping handling with the promo code SLUMP at manscaped.com. That's the promo code SLUMP at manscaped.com. Get your lawnmower 3.0 today. We are the Slump Busters. And we approve this message. I'm LeBron James. No, I'm not. But I'm the king when it comes to sports betting. Bet Razor. Razorsport.com. All right, guys, we are back. So, NFC South, that is going to be the division we're going to be breaking down today. And it has been a division with a lot of change, a lot of turnover. Surprisingly, a team that finished under 500 in this division is going to be one of the more interesting teams to talk about in not just this specific episode, but in football altogether this upcoming season. Why? Because they signed the GOAT. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it's pretty obvious who we're talking about. But of course, we never start from the top of division. We always start from the bottom half. I mean, we are wrestlers. We're used to working up from the bottom. So let's go mm -hmm. ahead and start with the Carolina Panthers. So Carolina last season finished 5-11. and 11. A couple of notable things. They fired Ron Rivera, hired Matt Rule, so new role in Carolina. They signed Teddy Bridgewater after letting go of Cam Newton and Kyle Allen. So they literally gave up their first and second tier starter to sign Teddy Bridgewater. They still have um, talent there as well. They re-signed 
run CMC to a four-year extension, $64 million guaranteed, only, or sorry, $64 million contract with $30 million guaranteed. Surprisingly, there's many ways for the Panthers to get out of that one, so might have given him a sweetheart deal. They hired Joe Brady. Now, Joe Brady was the OC for LSU last year, and let's not forget, LSU's offense was perhaps the greatest offense in college football history. They had a Heisman winner. Joe Burrow threw for 60-plus touchdowns. They broke the FBS record for points scored with 726. A couple more notable additions, signed Robbie Anderson, let go of Gerald McCoy. But I'm not expecting big things from the Panthers from the get-go. I don't have them winning a lot of games this year. Dre, do you concur, or where are you at with them? No, I 100% concur. I know Teddy Bridgewater probably is an upgrade at quarterback for them, um, especially what we saw from Teddy last year. Well, upgrade a, over Cam? Not over Cam, but Cam also didn't play last year, though. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. In comparison to last year, they had an upgrade. Uh, but no, Teddy Bridgewater is nowhere near, you know, what, when Cam is at his best, Cam is easily the better quarterback. Um, but Cam didn't play last year, so they got better at quarterback. Though the rest of the roster, there's been a lot of transitions. And then, like you said, new coach – new coordinators. So I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of success from them. I'm really hoping that we can see them start to rebuild successfully. I think they've got sort of a good plan to do it, uh, but I don't see a whole lot of success this season. So I'm going to give them sort of a generous six and 10. I am less generous, my friend. I have them going three and 13 this year, and this is not a huge shot at them. I don't think that they are doing a lot of things wrong necessarily. Mm-hmm. David Tepper, he, when he came in last season, it was clear that he wanted to make this front office younger. He wanted to bring in his guys. He was a little bit through with the old guard. He was through with the Gettleman's. He was through with Ron Vera. And he was through with Cam. So Teddy Bridgewater, a more controllable quarterback, less eccentric, of course, but also more conservative. Teddy Bridgewater is not going to push this offense, really, unless Joe Brady gets to him and says, I think we're going to make this offense more dynamic. We're going to push more things. Again, Joe Burrow was not a high draft prospect last year and set records was phenomenal. Can that happen with Teddy? I haven't seen it or I haven't seen much of anything to really make me think that he can do that. It's also worth noting that Joe Brady was also a coordinator or not a coordinator, but at least an assistant for the offense with the saints who Teddy Bridgewater, of course, was just coming from in the off season. Um, also they did sign PJ Walker, a star in the XFL. So there is potential for there to be a little bit of a competition. They drafted a QB last year. Uh, Unfortunately, the name is escaping me. I do remember he came in last year and wasn't that great, but it is essentially a tough battle for the backup position out there in Carolina. I think overall, this team is going to be better in three years, not in 2020. Because Matt Rule does have a track record of coming in and turning around organizations, turning around college football programs. He did a phenomenal job with Temple. He did a fantastic job with Baylor. And now he's coming into this organization that definitely is looking for some change. They're not that far removed from being in the Super Bowl. Let's not forget, 2015 was not that long ago. I know 2020 has felt like an eternity, but this organization has seen success in its time. So I do believe in that role long-term. It's just a first-year coaching hire, a quarterback that hasn't really been the starter in several years going back to Minnesota. And even then, the offense didn't really revolve around him. I think you're going to see some bright spots. I think DJ Moore might have a decent season. Here's a fun question. Will Christian McCaffrey repeat with 1,000 yards, 1,000 rushing, or 1,000 receiving yards? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I'm going to say no. Uh, I just think that that's too hard to, to obtain again, right? Like you, we, we see it time and time again. You have these guys that have these huge breakout seasons uh, and then everybody sort of just catches on and, and you start to figure out like, hey, that's their, their go-to weapon, right? So I'm going to say no on that. I think, I think it's going to be fine though. Yeah, I think moving away from North Turner, North Turner loves to check down to the running backs. I think Joe Brady's, of course, going to want to use his best piece on offense. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I think Christian McCaffrey is going to take a slight step back. So that's important to know for you fantasy owners when you're deciding on Christian McCaffrey, Saquon, Zeke up top. I think you still have to go with Christian McCaffrey, number one. 
you're crazy if you don't. But at the same time, let's not ignore there is a coaching turnover, so it may affect how they utilize them. Yep. All right. I, I think we've talked enough about the Panthers. This team's still a couple years away. 2020 is not their year. 3-13, and 13, you gave them 6-10. and 10. Let's talk about those Falcons, though. Or actually, no. The second to last team was surprisingly the Tampa Bay Bucks. So let's not talk about those Falcons. It, it's, it's time to talk about Tom Brady going to Tampa. It was the biggest offseason storyline. It was in a pre-COVID world. Things were simpler. Things were nice. Things were normal. And then Tom went to Tampa and just ruined everything. I didn't realize that Tom being in Boston was literally keeping this world together. I think we underrated Tom Brady's impact on our society. And Dre, I think it's important that you finally apologize to him. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe it's actually Bill Belichick. This is his way of, of cheating is he just gave the whole world COVID-19 to screw over Tom Brady and the rest of the, you know, rest of the country. He clearly screwed over his own team though. They, they had the most <laughs> that opt-outs if that's the case. <laughs> I know that is true. Uh, no, this team, you know, is definitely going to be a new look for him. Uh, I'm excited to see what this offense can do with, with, you know, Brady being there. But again, I, I'm on the side that Brady, I think is old and I think he really did benefit from a good system and a good team, right? Or at least I shouldn't say good team, but a well-run team, right? There was times where everybody had always said like, well, his receivers were questionable, right? Like his running backs were questionable. Um, he didn't have a whole lot of help, but the system overall worked, right? And the defense was really stout. And I think, you know, being in a new system that he doesn't know as well, yes, he's a hard worker. And yes, he maybe has, you know, a better receiving core than he's had in, uh, at least as of late in New England, uh, but again, his lines maybe not the best, or at least not as good as New England's. And again, it's just a totally different scheme, totally different system. And we'll see how well he can adjust. And especially when the team isn't as regimented as it is in New England. I know a lot of guys are saying like, oh, Brady wanted to get away from that, right? To be able to relax and enjoy his last few years. But sometimes you don't know how good you have it until you leave. And then you realize like, oh man, that's why Bill Belichick is the best at what he does. And that's why the Patriots are the best at what they do. I think, you know, you also have Gronk coming out of retirement to go back. Everybody's been talking about him sort of in a similar boat of that. Like he had sort of just been worn down and drained by the Belichick system and the Patriot organization. Now he's back. He seems like he's having fun, but you took a whole year off of football. I don't know if you necessarily get any better, right. By taking a year off. Um, and now you're a whole year older. So I, I think there's a lot of expectations surrounding this team. There's a lot of buzz, but at the end of the day, I still don't think that they're going to be, you know, an amazing team. So I'll have them going 10 and six. Okay. 10 and six for Dre. Well, let's run through just a couple of the more notable moves coming from them. So of course, Tom Brady signed a two year, $50 million guaranteed, fully guaranteed contract. So one of the few fully guaranteed deals you'll see in the NFL, Rob Gronkowski, of course, traded to the Patriots for a fourth round pick coming off, again, a year of premature retirement. They did draft Christian Wharf, which is a big offensive tackle out of Iowa, so they're trying to shore up that offensive line. Let's face it, Tom Brady's not the most mobile guy in the world. He needs a clean pocket. This is the type of guy that can do it. We know Iowa, their tight ends, their offensive line, they know how to block. They re-signed J JPP and franchise tag Shaq Barrett, who had 19 and a half sacks last season. Very underrated defense. In fact, you might even say this is one of the best, if not the best, front seven in football. Because aside from JPP and Shaq Barrett, they have Devin White, Vita Vea, Lamonte David, who is one of the more underrated middle linebackers in football. I think it helps when your quarterback doesn't throw 30-plus interceptions. We know Brady's not going to throw interceptions, so that's going to only enhance the defense. I feel like one of the biggest things that hurt Tampa Bay as a whole is consistently being negative yardage situations. Let's face it. If you're a defense, you have to come off the field or come back on the field consistently because your quarterback can't keep the ball in their hands. That is frustrating though. It is noteworthy that Jameis's last pass as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer and Tom Brady's last pass as a new England Patriot were both pick sixes. Fun fact there. Just thought I'd throw it. As far as my expectations for this team, so this is going to kind of spoil alert the rest of the division for me, but I have them winning the NFC South. I have them going 11 and five. 
I think that despite the turnover, despite this being a new look offense, they have all the right pieces. Tom Brady didn't have a Mike Evans in New England. He sure as hell didn't have a Chris Godwin. Besides Gronk, and Gronk is a nice piece, but I'm not expecting 2013, 2014 Rob Gronkowski. I'm expecting a guy who didn't come, took a year off, lost a lot of muscle mass. That's the Rob Gronkowski I'm expecting. Look for someone no one's expecting. Like OJ Howard, a Cameron Brait to have a decent year. Keyshawn Vaughn, Ronald Jones. Ronald Jones in camp the other day was said to be catching everything. I, my only question is, do you think this offense is going to be more Bruce Arians or is it going to be more Tom Brady? Well, Tom has said that he's willing to run Bruce Arians' system. And we know that Bruce Arians is a pretty good quarterback coach when, you know, and just in general offensive coach. So I think it really will. I think Tom is going to try to make it Bruce Arians' offense. I also just don't know how successful Tom would be, right, in implementing his own system uh, going to, you know, to the Tampa Bay, right? It's not like he was a Peyton Manning type player or anything like that. So I, I really do think that'll be Bruce Arians, uh, but it may be closer to like a 50-50, right? Like you get the greatness of Tom Brady and the accuracy and the tenacity that he has and discipline uh, as well as a good system in Arians and a good coach. Well, Dre actually saying Tom Brady has greatness. He does. I, he, is, he is a great quarterback. I do think he's a little bit overrated right now. I, you know, when you're, whenever you're that old, I don't care. Oh, dude, the athlete. old jokes. We're just cracking these old times. When you are here. old, you know, that's just how it is. Like, you're Are old. you going to break out the, uh, what's it called, the baby powder and just go, Tom Brady's so old, you know, just uh, we're going to go white chicks with it? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. That's going to be exactly what it is. I'll buy him a cane for his birthday or something like that, a walker. Drizzle. And if you don't know what drizzle it is, it basically is an excuse to say, if someone makes an I am statement or an I will statement, <laughs> either they have to do it or they have to buy you lunch. I'm going to hold that standard here in this podcast. So Dre, if you don't buy Tom Brady a cane for his birthday, I would like Sadie's green chili. So go ahead and ship that over to Austin, Texas. I, I know you know the address. No, if I, if I had Tom Brady's address, I'd send him a cane. I'll do it right now. You could just send it to Tampa because we know he runs that whole city. It's his yard. Whatever house, that's Tom Brady's house. He shows he just up walks whenever he, he just walks in there. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he should have walked in when that guy saw him in his house and just said, this is my house now. Do you realize you're in Tampa Bay? Yeah. TB12, bitch. TB12. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, just imagine that, though. A pro athlete walking into your house saying, like, hey, get out. <laughs> like, I couldn't, couldn't imagine. Hey, is this Bry Byron's place? Who the fuck's Byron? Byron. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Would have been oh so my god just looking up and seeing tom brady yeah I'm really like, chilling on the, the couch fuck? right what the fuck <laughs> oh you're, you're tom brady yeah. why are you in my house <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> you should yeah. play it off casually i know i don't even know what i would do in that situation but anyways no i think we're what would you do if you're tom <laughs> you walk in have you ever accidentally walked into someone's house or apartment and just instantly have turned around i've walked, walked into the wrong class in college before oh that's awkward yeah it's like you're sitting there and you're like mm, did i sign up for this class bye guys <laughs> just make sure you don't you're not sitting too far up front that's when it gets really awkward Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're the one person that picks up their bags and walks out right all the way up the stairs. You just have to do it as quietly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, what's good. What happens in that situation? You end up dropping something. It, it never goes according to plan. You're, you never go stealth mode whenever you fuck up like that. <laughs> all right. Well, again, I have Tampa Bay finishing 11 and five. Dre, you said 10 and six. Yep. 10 and six. Okay. Positive, optimistic expectations for Tom Brady's first year in Tampa. We know this is one of the most interesting teams in football, but we have to space out who we think are going to be fighting for this division. We have to talk about that team that actually did finish second in the division last year. So rise up. We're talking about those Atlanta Falcons. So Atlanta's season was pretty unique. They started off one in seven, and then they just got hot. 
They managed to finish with a six and two over the last eight games. They beat not only the Saints, but they beat the Niners in back-to-back weeks. How did they do it? Well, Dan Quinn heard the murmurs. He heard everyone talking about Dan Quinn is going to get fired before the season ends. So during their bye week, one of the stories that came out is they literally reshuffled their coaching staff based off putting names in a hat. So you saw Raheem Morris, who was the wide receiver coach. He became the DB coach. Dave Braugh, running back coach. He went to wide receiving coach. Bernie Parmalee was an offensive assistant, and he ended up as the special teams coach. At the end of the day, it worked. This team made a little bit of a turnaround. What was causing them issues at the start of the year, though? Their offense has been kind of mediocre, obviously, since Kyle Shanahan left. They've had some spurts of brilliance, even year magic for Matt Ryan. But in those odd years, it's a really odd team. You don't know what to expect. When it comes to what they've done this season, they let go of several team, several pieces that other teams were happy to overpay. Vic Beasley, who has been on that team for a while, tight ends decided to overpay him. Austin Hooper somehow became the highest paid tight end in football before George Kittle's deal, and they went out and picked up Hayden Hurst. And then they stole off some scraps from the LA Rams and two of their most interesting offseason acquisitions. So Dante Fowler and then Todd Gurley. A.J. Terrell was their first-round pick, cornerback out of Clemson. So they've done a lot of stuff to make this team more viable, more interesting. Last year, they finished seven and nine. My record for them, though, off the bat, despite all this change, I had them still finishing seven and nine. I think they just still have to have too competitive a schedule. And I think it's going to be hard for this team to make a quick turnaround. Todd Gurley averaged less than four yards per carry last season. And he had the lowest amount of targets since his rookie season with only 49. In fact, his attempts per game went down by about four. So he's on the back burner. I don't know if you can expect Todd Gurley to be Todd Gurley of 2017. I have my doubts about this team. Dre, what do you think about the Falcons? Now, I resonate with everything that you just said. And, you know, I'm hoping that Todd Gurley maybe can reignite that spark because that 2017 Todd Gurley was fantastic and incredibly fun to watch. But that season alone probably put so much mileage on him, right? That that was basically the end of, you know, the Todd Gurley that we, we would all enjoy watching. And so I'm in the same boat as you. I don't have them being that successful. I have them going uh, six and 10. Well, I guess the big question here is, is this Dan Quinn's last season in Atlanta? Uh, Maybe he'll just shuffle the coaching staff every single week (laughs) to make sure that they just keep winning. Just always drawing names out of the hat. He's just going to shuffle himself out of Atlanta, I think, by the end of the year. I think Dan Quinn is not a terrible coach. I just think that He's been carried by having good assistants. Mm-hmm. I, obviously, again, we go back to the Kyle Shanahan thing. That 2016 offense that took him to the Super Bowl, it was by far and away their best year. And I think that was only made possible by having someone that could run that. Because at the end of the day, Dan Quinn's not a play caller. And I think if you're an offense or you're a team executive, you want guys that are play callers because it accomplishes two things. If you have the head coach and he's going to plays, you don't have to worry about hiring an offensive assistant. That's why I'm going to throw this name out there. I'm just going to try and be ahead of the curve on this take. Lincoln Riley, Atlanta. That would be really fun to watch with Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley. What do you think about that, Dre? Am I being too bold? Is that a take that can happen? And are Atlanta Falcons fans going to be excited for the next five years of fantastic offense? I, I would actually really like to see that. I think, you know, like you said, all the pieces fit really well. The coaching style fits really well. The offense that, you know, Lincoln Riley likes to, ha- likes to have, um, you know, it, it would be more, you know, quote unquote, like college offense, right? Compared to like mm-hmm. some of the NFL, but maybe that's the brand of football that they need, you know, and, and I could see, and I think Lincoln Riley is a good, good enough coach that he would make those adjustments, right? Like he'd find a way to make that offense work in the NFL, right? And at least transition it. Uh, fairly smoothly. So that's a, that's a good, uh, good call, Juju. I, I would actually be excited for that. Is it too unfair that I just gave Atlanta Falcons fans just hope everywhere that they were going to fire Dan Quinn and hire the best coach in college football? 
now they're going to extend Dan Quinn another five years or something like that. <laughs> this misery. You're going the negative take. I'm staying positive. I am, aside from giving them a seven and nine record, of course. But uh, yeah, so shame. Okay. I mean, I like the Falcons, but, and I wanted to give them a better record. Again, I just went through their schedule and I just couldn't see where the wins were. That was the problem with it. I'm Same sorry. with me. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I didn't see them getting a whole lot of wins. Like even though they get those weird wins over some good teams, it's just, Nine out of 10 times, I'm not going to choose them over the better team. All right, Dre. Well, I do have a f- great reason to be excited before we talk about this next team. On this podcast, we got twins. Yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, so coming on to the podcast, you've heard them before. One of our funniest episodes, one of my favorite episodes from the Bottom Line Sports Podcast. We have Gary and Kerry Jackson here to talk about their New Orleans Saints. Here's a quick word from them. What's up, y'all? This is Kerry. And this is Gary with the Bottom Line Sports Talk Podcast. About to give y'all some insight on the New Orleans Saints. We are worried about our cornerbacks, but I think everything else will be good. We're not worried about anybody else in our division. We finish in first place, as always. The D-line going to do their thing. The offense going to do their thing. So... Questionable moves have always been made with the Saints, and it has to do with defense. If we don't do good in our cornerback position, because that's our biggest weakness, we stand to not be as good as we are. And if we get past happy and don't focus on being a balanced offense, we stand to not be as good as we're supposed to be. Having said that, we should finish first in our division. We should get one through three as far as the seating. But if we don't have home field throughout the playoffs, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Also, football shouldn't be going on. Also, the Saints going to win 2021 Super Bowl. That's it. All right, guys, we are back. Thank you, of course, to Gary and Carrie. Again, two of the funniest guys we've ever had on this show. Go ahead and check out our last episode we had them on. Find out who is the best stoner athlete of all time. Go ahead and give them a subscription, a like, a follow. BL Sports Talk 51. You can find them on both Instagram and Twitter. Moving forward, so we get to talk about their New Orleans Saints. So the New Orleans Saints last year finished 13-3, and three, and then they did what they always do, lose to the Vikings in the playoffs <laughs> on a questionable call, to say the least. In the offseason, the New Orleans Saints were pretty quiet. They didn't make a lot of noise, per se. They re-signed, or they signed Emmanuel Sanders. They re-signed their center, Andres Pete. They drafted another center, Cesar Ruiz, who I imagine is probably going to slide over into guard to shore up that offensive line a little bit more. Of course, when you have an older quarterback, you want to protect them. Similar to what we talked about with Tom Brady. Drew Brees had probably the most interesting offseason, but not for football-related reasons necessarily. Um, Obviously, his commentary on the flag, not a huge deal in the grand scheme of themes when we really look at this entire year. He did have, of course, he he has his job lined up post-football. He signed a deal with NBC for as soon as he retires. He will be on the broadcast. So, Exciting news for Drew Brees when he does retire and move on. He did miss five games last year with a hand injury, but I don't think you can say Drew Brees is injury prone. Of course, it bounced off some dude's helmet. What are you going to do? Biggest things they actually did might not even affect them here in 2020. They were both at the quarterback position, though. They signed Jameis Winston, and then they extended Taysom Hill for a two-year $16 million deal. Overall, I may have said it on other podcasts before, I saw the Saints not making the playoffs, but as I went through their schedule, naturally, things just kind of formulated, and they're probably going to be in the playoffs at the end of the day. I have them going 10-6, and if I'm not mistaken. Let me just pull up their record again real quick on my little spreadsheet here. Yeah, 10-6, and so finishing behind the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Dre, where do you have the Saints? Yeah, I think the continuity is going to be good. We'll see, you know, I give Tom Brady a whole lot of crap about being old. Drew Brees isn't necessarily young himself and capable of, and we always sort of see him taper off towards, you know, the end of the year or into the playoffs, which sort of disappoints me because if he can maintain his level of play all year round, we, we would definitely see some good matchups in the playoffs, if not see them make it to another Super Bowl, which I would love for Drew Brees. Um, but I do think the continuity is good. I do think, again, they've still got a tough team. Obviously, they did last season. 
Uh, and so for all those reasons, and their schedule really wasn't like too difficult. Like they did have some tough matchups there, uh, but I have them going 12 and four and winning the division. I think what you said there is probably the best thing you could say about the Saints. Continuity. This has not been an ideal offseason for a lot of teams. And when you talk about teams that have switched quarterbacks, drafted rookies, and had a lot of coaching turnover, they're going to be at the ultimate disadvantage. What the Saints can say, hey, we're bringing it back pretty much the majority of our offensive line. We're bringing it back the same Hall of Fame head coach and the same Hall of Fame quarterback. At the wide receiver two spot, we're not so much de depending on um, Traymond Smith. We're depending on Emmanuel Sanders, who's a veteran, who was traded midseason last year to the 49ers, stepped in, learned the offense, and knew what he was doing. Emmanuel Sanders is definitely an upgrade over someone like a Ted Ginn Jr. As much as I love Ted Ginn, he's a fun receiver to watch and managed to stick around the league despite many calling him a bust. But Emmanuel Sanders is far and away better, and I think Drew Brees is going to love that type of wide receiver. I guess my only question is <laughs> about the Saints. Did uh, Madden get Michael Thomas's rating right? Because there's not too much to pick apart here. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's crazy is Michael Thomas is so freaking good. And that's why he's one of the highest paid receivers in the league, right? Is that he, he definitely deserves it. So I forget, what did Madden rank him at? Like they gave him a 99, was, but I think they gave him a 99 just so he won't cry. Yeah, yeah. No, 99 is, 99 is pretty good in, in Madden. I, and I think, you know, Michael Thomas is deserving of being ranked that high. Um, like, it's hard to have a, a perfect score, perfect ranking for any athlete in any of the sports games, but that's about as good as it gets, you know? So do you think that there's still any lingering resentment between Drew Brees and his teammates? Uh, I don't think you were on the episode where we did talk about Drew Brees. Yeah. From all his comments about, you know, standing for the flag and stuff like that. I, I don't think so. I think, you know, eventually you get over it. And especially, you know, we talked about continuity. Those guys have been playing together for, for forever. And from, you know, all accounts that I hear, Drew Brees is actually a legitimate good guy. And, you know, it's not like he's a jerk in the locker room, at least from what I hear. So I think they're willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. And they're willing to say, hey, I didn't like your comments. I think you misspoke, uh, but I'm willing to forgive you. And Drew Brees came out and his wife came out with, you know, statements saying we apologize. We didn't mean for it to come out that way. We're trying to educate ourselves on, you know, the struggles of, of minorities, right? Um, no. So I don't think there's any lingering issues. I do think his teammates have his back, and I think they're going to forgive him. So again, I have the Saints going 10 and 6. Dre, you have them going 12 and 4. Yep. Um, I do want to give a prayer or shout out to New the city of New Orleans because we have some interesting weather developments. Obviously, we were there in 2005 whenever things didn't go right. So we're just hoping everything goes smoothly as – two hurricane fronts seem to be moving towards each other. If that isn't the most 2020 headline, I don't know what to tell you guys. But another fantastic show in the books. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for Gary and Carrie for Akellers coming on to break down their saints. Keep hitting that subscribe button, listeners. We need it. We love you. At Slump Buster Podcast on IG. At Slump Buster Pod on Twitter. Go to the website, theslumpbuster.com. All right, guys. I mean, that, that's pretty much it. So stay safe, happy, and healthy, and we'll see you next time.